Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, to this press conference from the 49th Annual Meeting of the World Economic Forum here in Davos. Good morning to the third day of this meeting. We're starting a couple of minutes late. Uh, we hope it's not a symbol for Europe being late in the innovation race. Uh, everybody's talking about China and the US being locked in this battle for tech dominance. So the question is, um, where do we stand uh, with Europe and how competitive is Europe? in this global uh, innovation race. This press conference is also dedicated to a launch uh, of this report, Innovate Europe. Uh, my colleagues here have some copies if you're interested, and you'll also find it online on our website uh, as of now. Thank you for joining here in the room, and thank you for being um, on the live stream here with us, whether through uh, Facebook, Twitter, or our website, uh, welcome. Um, without further ado, let me introduce our wonderful panel here this, uh, this morning. To my immediate left, uh, we're joined uh, by Martina Larkin. She's the head of Europe and Eurasia and a member of the executive committee of the World Economic Forum. Uh, to her immediate left, uh, we're very pleased to be joined by the Prime Minister uh, of Estonia, Yuri Ratas. Right at the heart and center of our panel, we're joined by uh, Gillian Tanz. She's the CEO of Booking.com. Uh, to her left, uh, we're joined by Klaus Hommels, who's the founder and CEO of Lakestar Advisors, one of Europe's biggest uh, venture capital funds. And last but definitely not least, uh, the man with the most difficult name for me to pronounce on this panel, uh, Jürgen Wieck Knutstorp, the chairman of the Lego Group. Uh, I hope I got that right. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, Martina, um, the Innovate Europe report. Tell us a little bit about what it is and why the World Economic Forum is doing this piece of work. Thank you, Georg, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we have been quite concerned about uh, Europe being left behind when it comes to innovation and to leading the transformations brought about by this fourth and revolution, as you mentioned. None of the 10 biggest tech companies are in, from Europe. Um, the large platform companies in the US and China are dominating the, the marketplace. Um, and investments in AI, for example, are very small in Europe when you compare it to the US and, and China. And the scale in Europe still has no comparison when it comes to the rest of, of the world. So um, given the concerted efforts in China and the US, we really feel Europe needs to step it up, essentially, and, and really develop a much more um, you know, scaled up and, and better innovation model. Um, across the region. So we brought together a number of um, thought leaders, experts, uh, digital leaders, um, some of them on, on this panel as well, uh, to really think about what this new innovation model could look like. Uh, because Europe does have some uh, good aspects in its economy. As we know, it it's, has uh, one third of the top universities and research uh, institutes in science and engineering. Uh, we're leading in e-governance um, and, of course, on data protection and, and, and regulation with the GDPR, Europe has taken a big step forward as well. So we have developed this a new um, uh, report and an innovation model, essentially, to think about how Europe can lead when it comes to this uh, innovation race. And we've identified, essentially, four key catalysts that Europe needs to focus on. One of them is to be much more strategic when it comes to the industries that it uh, focuses on and it, that it wants to drive. And we think that we need to create much better cross-sectoral innovation strategies and platforms for high-performing industries like healthcare, like the financial sector, like manufacturing. And for example, in the UK, we have seen how they have pushed fintech also through sandbox uh, experimentations and really helped fintech companies be much more innovative uh, in the future. Uh, the other aspect is data, and Europe uh, needs to and can lead when it comes to data governance. Uh, and and as, as many of you know, data is sort of the new oil, that is what is being said all the time. So uh, Europe can change the di data dynamics and needs to lead when we think about governance of data uh, around the world and, and developing a system that is based also on European values and, and principles. Um, and governments can uh, also play a big role in this when it comes to really the governance of, of, of data. And then the third aspect really relates to, to capital, uh, to talent. And it has also been said by the forum and by our chairman that uh, talent is winning over capital because capital is becoming much more abundant in the world. But where you can really differentiate yourself and be much more competitive is when it comes to talent. And those companies and those countries that can attract the talent will ultimately be the winners. 
And here, again, we can do much more to attract more talent, but also grow them and keep them in the region because we see a lot of talent leave uh, Europe to go to the US, to go to China, to go to do other parts of the world. And specifically also, um, we would like to encourage European uh, companies to increase female entrepreneurship because only 5% uh, of female founder companies um, were female in 2007 alone. So there's huge uh, opportunities uh, for, for growth uh, in that respect. And then the last uh, part I would say when it comes to this European model of innovation is related to the public leadership, public sector leadership. Again, we have huge uh, public procurement in, um, in Europe, and this can be allocated much more strategically, much more dedicated also to digital industries and growing the digital economy as, as we see it. Thank you, Martina. And probably here in Davos, we should say data is the new snow, um, but uh, we can go with oil for now. Uh, Prime Minister, um, people might not usually look to governments for, for innovation. Now, Estonia is a bit of a poster child in Europe for innovation, and especially your e-governance um, is uh, unrivaled uh, in Europe. What role do you see for the, for the public sector in, in that innovation race? Yeah, thank you. Uh, also, good morning, and I would like first uh, to thank uh, this opportunity to be and to take part the World Economic Forum and also for the initiative and work with the report and for inviting me here today. I have, that's true, that I have uh, the honor to be the Prime Minister in a country that uh, takes innovation very seriously, and there are several ways for the government to facilitate innovation. It starts with providing good quality education for all school children, education that gives kids the ability to better interact with technology. We need talented people in order to have innovative ideas. And uh, the governments are responsible for providing a good business environment that supports innovation. Legislation has to be flexible to keep up with the fast technological change, whether it is self-driving cars or using AI in products and uh, services. The government can also be a role model by being open and innovative itself. Uh, this is uh, where I believe Estonia can provide very good example. Together with the uh, private sector, we have built a digital government which provides daily concrete value for our people and for our businesses uh, in terms of time and money saved, easier uh, access to services and much more. We have secure data management where individual data is cross-used for several services but stays under the control of the individual. Over the past 20 years we have also built strong trust in digital solutions by maintaining them user-friendly and cyber-secure. Of course, other countries have their own success stories. The question now is how to gain advantage on European level. We want the total outcome for the EU to be larger than the sum of all the contributions made in every single member state. Europe has to remain competitive in turbulent times of rapid technological and social change. We can build on our strengths, shared values and cross-border cooperation. We must raise the bar by having high standards concerning cybersecurity in addition to the existing set of general data protection value. Rules. The focus needs to be on making the single market for better in the digital age. This includes having strong digital IDs, a framework to tackle cyber threats, and of course the free movement of data. There is still a lot to do also in Europe level. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, Gillian, um, you're running Booking.com. Now, um, if, uh, if you take 27 Lego pieces, they fit nicely together. Uh, you might not say the same about uh, the, the member states and the European Union. So I'd like to hear from you, what are the standardizations we need to really have a single digital market in Europe? And, and yeah. how can that help innovation? Yeah, so uh, first of all, let me say that uh, 
Yeah, it was an honor to be able to participate on this report, right? We are a business that started off in, in Europe and we've grew our business all over the world out of Europe. So Europe for us is, is so important, both as because we're, we're, we're based in Europe, but also uh, because, of course, we operate in, in all of the countries uh, in Europe. I think this report shows both the strengths and weaknesses uh, of Europe with a very tangible action plan, which needs to ensure that Europe remains uh, competitive. Um, we looked at input for two areas so uh, that are crit critical, uh, in our opinion, for the long-term success. So the first one is uh, digital infrastructure and interoperability. Uh, <laughs> so if we don't, don't have the right infrastructure in place, we will not be able to compete with digital, bigger digital economies. We need to remove existing friction that you see all across countries in Europe, and we need to make sure that we have a close collaboration to get there between businesses and governments across countries. And this goes basically from broadband to, to software, uh, software companies to make sure that we, uh, we make improvement. The second notion is really around harmonizing legislation and standards. Creating a true digital single economy will be crucial for future success. Uh, a single regulatory or competence center should be established with the responsibility to develop key principles in the areas of innovation, such as algorithm governments to look at fair taxation of digital companies and the comp competition of mobile play players. I think if you look at emerging innovative technology companies in Europe today, they simply cannot operate if every few hundred miles they have to deal with different standards, uh, different law and different regulations. The burden is too much for companies today and it's distracting. While they should be focused on these 500 million customers that we have in Europe to build better successes. I think we have the innovation in Europe, we have the drive and the appetite and the willingness of getting, getting there, but I think sometimes we're getting in our own way. And I hope that with this report, it shows clear actions what should be considered to keep building uh, successes. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, Klaus, you told me earlier that, you, that you're from Grevenbroich, the iconic uh, German town that nobody knows in the room here or on the live stream. Well, we have one gentleman who knows it. Do, do you sometimes wish uh, you were born in Shenzhen or San Francisco? How is the funding situation for innovation in, in Europe? What's your, what's your latest update there? No. <coughs> to answer your first question, I think I'm pretty happy being born in the Rhineland. Yeah, for a few more reasons. Um, <coughs> nevertheless, the funding situation is, uh, is better in different areas in the world. Let's reassess where do funding nor does funding normally come from. If you go to the US, funding for VC comes from endowments, um, pension funds, and family offices, um, and insurances. So if you go to China, China, the state, plays a very active role and provides in um, every year and the double digit billion financing for, for VC and for, <coughs> for startups. In Europe, um, the picture is a little bit different. So we do not have endowments in the classical way like we have it in the US, very few. The regulation prohibits insurances and pension funds to invest into, into venture. So all this uh, gives us a pretty, um, an area with very little powder to, to take part in uh, the, the, the race that is currently going on. To give you an idea, the biggest 30 companies, which are digital companies, which are not listed, they had a total financing the last eight years of 62 or 64 billion. Uh, in this financing, in 14% of the rounds, European government money took part. Europe's money invested 1.9%. And we are represented with 1.4% in the cap table of these decisive companies. So meaning we are not happening on a global scale if it comes to, to participation in that development. So if we look at, at, at Europe, the situation is within Europe that we do have a decent um, a system for early stage. The EIF has, has done a really good job. But then we took public money and the public help to make these companies grow. And the moment they need a 40 or 50 million financing, there's nothing here in Europe anymore. 
and then these companies rely on foreign financing, which implies that at this moment, foreign uh, funds invest in these companies, which means they get into the supervisory board, they define in the uh, share purchase agreement in what way and which rights uh, this company is governed. So, f uh, tech, so actually we are losing these companies at the moment of this kind of financing, more, so which is, which is uh, really, really for Europe um, a disaster, I think. Um, it is popular to always cry for more money, yeah? so, but let's uh, underpin it with some facts. If we want to play the game as it is played in the US or in China, the big companies, the big 20, 30, have in average gotten financing of 2.2 billion. So if we are not in a position to finance companies in this kind of vicinity, then we structurally will not happen in these big companies. Secondly, if it's not the very, very big ones, all the ones that have gotten to a stock exchange and had achieved a listing, they got $240 million. So we need to think that there's really a step change in, um, in the way we have to think about money. Um, <clears throat> the good thing is we do not need, if we ask states and other participants to, to invest in this market, we do not need to ask for grants or subsidies or whatsoever. So if you look at the European Investment Fund, the 2012 vintage of uh, their VC fund, which is a structural one, is above 14%. So it has become an attractive asset class, which um, there are very little reasons uh, not to consider investing in from the big capital pools. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Um, Jürgen, um, Martina already mentioned it's not just capital, it's also talent. Uh, and I know you're, this is keeping you up at night, the questions about what talents do we need, what skilling, what reskilling do we need to do in Europe to be competitive. Please share with us your thoughts. Thank you very much. I think, as some of my other members of the panel have described, is there's both reason to be optimistic and, and somewhat concerned for the future of Europe. Uh, I actually had a very positive experience coming here on Monday and being part of this annual talent competitiveness index uh, conversation that uh, World Economic Forum is doing with, with INSEAD. And actually, on the list of top 20 countries around the world for talent development, it's strongly dominated by European countries. Uh, Switzerland being on top, uh, some of the Scandinavian countries also being in the top five. So, so I think we have many of the important conditions for talent development. The, 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 the thing, of course, we will have to address is so-called upskilling and, and reskilling of the workforce to be ready for the fourth industrial revolution. And the angle I would like to allow myself to take here is how do we do even right skilling from the beginning? How do we create talent that is capable of lifelong learning? And, and that lifelong learning turns out to originate in childhood, how we grow up and how we are going through uh, the basic education uh, system. So uh, one of the really critical things is early childhood development. It is uh, what you're being exposed to. Children are natural learners, but as we grow up, we sometimes stop learning because we are no longer uh, curious, because we are not willing to take risk, we're not willing to be playful. And there are education systems that deliberately minimize that, and there are education systems that constantly encourage that capacity to have curiosity, to have resilience, uh, to have creativity, to be able to construct uh, your own knowledge, for instance, uh, in the kindergarten system uh, and early school systems, there are some systems that are based on a sort of instructional uh, pedagogy. You see a picture of a football and you ask the children, what is this? They raise their hand and say, this is a football. But if they have never actually played with a football, if they may even make their own football, they really do not understand what it is. They just know when they see the picture, this is what it is. So if we need talent that is capable of inventing new companies to reskill themselves, to uh, acquire new skills, they have to have made, so to speak, their own footballs. They have to construct uh, their own knowledge. That is the source of the entrepreneurial uh, creativity that I think we need uh, for the future of Europe. And it's, to some degree, 
that means turning our education system upside down. Uh, there has been intensive research on what makes people creative at the workplace. It's a combination of creativity and discipline. But in terms of learning, it's about at apprenticeship. And I think Europe, including here in Switzerland, has some really phenomenal models of apprenticeship. But what it means is we learn through the specific and then we abstract up into theory. Unfortunately, many education systems, and this was discussed on Monday in the Talent Competitive Index as well, focused on giving people degrees and passing through tests. That's learning generalistic knowledge, but what we need is people who have <coughs> specific skills who are then able to move from the specific skill up to the abstract uh, knowledge. So what is this an example of? What can we learn from this? This is the kind of uh, talent we need to uh, start companies, to provide the innovation uh, across Europe. But I think uh, we have some education systems that provide that. We have the know-how to do it even better in the European education system. And we actually have phenomenal conditions for uh, the kind of talent that would like to work this way because they love to live in the European capital cities and be part of the European Union. So I'm very optimistic that if we can accomplish those things, we can create a much more interesting workforce. Thank you very much. And um, so we heard some optimistic, some maybe more pessimistic notes about Europe. Prime Minister, are you an optimist uh, about, the, uh, about Europe and the innovation race? Are your fellow um, uh, government leaders in Europe uh, looking at your example? Are they learning from you? That's true, that I'm quite optimist. And uh, why? I just uh, would like to give you one uh, very concrete fact. It was in the end of September 2017 when Estonia was the EU president's country and uh, then we had in our capital Tallinn the, the digital summit and it, it was the first time when all the European leaders we are together and uh, you, you mentioned this uh, digital infrastructure and I think that that is a very right uh, point uh, also here in, if you are talking if we are talking to innovation and the question um, was also this one and a half year ago about the digital infrastructure and what was very positive that all the countries all these 28 countries in, in the EU they are saying that we have the same very positive attitude about the digital infrastructure I'm very uh, I'm very, how to say, positive and uh, agree what you said, that uh, this data is this kind of new new goal. But uh, I would like to, to say that where is our problem? Our problem is actually that we haven't good infrastructure if we are talking the different digital solutions across the borders. And that is quite big problem also inside the EU. For example, I have very good news uh, about only about some days ago. We, we started the project between Finland and Estonia that, for example, Finnish people in Estonia, they could use the e-prescription. If they need some medicine, then they could use their identity, ID, ID card, and also the e-prescription. And that is a very concrete thing, I think, where we, we could see and we could be this kind of... Um, front uh, runners between uh, two countries and of course uh, like I said uh, in my speech that uh, more than uh, 20 years we, we have been uh, developed uh, and and build uh, this digital uh, society inside uh, inside Estonia thank you Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, let's give the members of the media a chance to, to bring us back down after this uh, positive note. Um, <laughs> um, we have a question from the gentleman. If you could identify yourself for the sake of our online audience as well, please. Hi, uh, good morning. I'm Kamaru from Estro Malaysia. Um, my question is, if you're looking at Europe, the digital economy knows no border, individuals or industries. E-Estonia, for example, is a digital citizenship. So how do you marry all these new possibilities and already realities of the digital economy and innovation that is regardless of geographical distance and demarcations. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think that you're asking also about this e-residency project, and that's true that uh, today uh, we have thousands and thousands of people who are taking the e-residence in Estonia and also run the business uh, under the EU legislation and under Estonian legislation. What, what is my point? that the, you must be very transparent, you, and the, the most important question is why 
different businesses or why different citizens they are using these different e-services or digital infrastructure. And I think here we could say that that's the best way to save our t time. That's the best way to be transparent. That's the best way to fight against corruption. And I think uh, these are very important aspects inside the Estonian society. And of course, today we are, we are very happy and we are saying welcome all the residents all over the world. And we, we could see that today we have more than, uh, I think, uh, 130, 150 countries where we have the e-residency. Thank you. Thank you. Gillian, at Booking.com, you know a thing or two about working across borders. Um, what's your perspective on how we can work with these technologies that are, by definition, borderless? Yeah, so, um, yeah, like I said, you know, the harmonization in Europe and the digital single economy is, is so crucial. And I think even more crucial today uh, than in the past, if you think about uh, technology and, and how digital companies, right, you need three things. You need ideas, which I think has improved a lot in Europe. If you think about the startup ecosystems, uh, uh, the funding that startups are getting, even though it is still less to other parts in the world, but you do see improvements. But besides the ideas, you need basically skill and speed. And, and today, that, that, that is crucial for to get more successes like booking coming out of Europe. And, and uh, I think there, the regulatory framework is extremely important to make sure that these companies are able to reach spill, scale. And speed also has to do with funding, which I think for scale-ups in Europe is very far behind to today. Thank you. Klaus, you want to add something? No, I think basically everything that I said. For the finance, I mean, there are no limits for finance anyways. Uh, for financing, so uh, that is an obvious one. Okay, we'll quote you on that, that there's no limits on the financing. <laughs> I'm sure uh, s some founders will be very happy uh, happy to hear that. <laughs> um, we probably have time for one more question. Uh, there's a gentleman in the back there, please. Hi, and I'm Bong from uh, Estonian publication Delphi. I've got a quick question for the Prime Minister. Your uh, co-panelist highlighted uh, the need for to look at pension funds as pos possible funding sources for um, digital economy. You're a prime minister. You've got pension funds in Estonia. Would you be willing to look at pension fund, relaxing pension fund uh, investment uh, regulation for them to be able to invest in digital uh, startups and also sort of success companies? Uh, thank you. I think that uh, to be in this market, if we are talking investments and pension funds, I think we must be very, very open on the one hand, but on the other hand, we, it is always the question how we could promote and how we could make it more uh, interesting for the pension funds to invest in different fields. And of course, in Estonia, we are really, really ready and we are really open and interesting in to have more investments also from the pension funds. Thank you. Klaus, I think that's a question that got your attention. Uh, do you want to add something? Yeah, that's true. So, um, <coughs> basically, the regulation comes from a time where in the Neue market and in the early 2000s, uh, the asset class destroyed a lot of value. So, and then the natural uh, instinct of a regulator is to protect um, the pensioners and, and, and make it more uh, um, complicated to invest in, in this asset class. But if you, this is... Um, long time back, and in order to, to to assess whether this asset class is a valid one or not, you have to give it some time. And fund investment or fund of fund investment in a, in a grown-up asset class venture in the US or in Europe, um, the risk, the implied risk that this asset class has now has nothing to do with the implied risk it had at the time when this regulation was done. So it is um, more than necessary to rethink the underlying risk models of that asset class. So basically allowing currently insurances have to underpin uh, VC investments plus 49% of equity, which, is, uh, which, which makes it very unattractive. So given the new risk profile of that mature asset class venture now, this can all be remodeled. 
Thank you very much. Um, mindful uh, of the time uh, and as a Swiss organization, uh, I have to close the press uh, conference here. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for watching and a special thank you to all our panelists today. And please go to our website, have a look at the report and uh, find out more about what the World Economic Forum is doing with its uh, wonderful panelists here in that space. Thank you very much. <laughs>